Hi, I am Sophie Vaux, and this is the Rise and Play podcast. In this new series, I am focusing on portraits of women who have an outstanding career in games. How did they get into games? How did they reach their high position and career? What have been their personal and career choices to get to their level, and why? I want to bring more light to the wide range of career paths available for women in leadership position in the industry, and to inspire you to dream big for your life and career too. Let's begin. Today I am delighted to have with me Laura Taranto. So a little more about Laura. Laura has more than 10 years of experience in the games industry, focusing predominantly on casual mobile games. While most of her experience is running and growing life titles, she has worked on games in all phases of development. She joined Big Fish Games in mid-June 2021 and has been focusing on growing ever much. Laura comes from Scopoli, King, and Wooga, where she worked on multiple titles, including Farm Hero Saga, Perspiro, and Diamond Dash. So hi, Laura. Super excited to have you here. Oh, hello. I'm super excited to be here. Nice, nice. So to begin with, I'd like to ask, what is the most exciting thing you are working on at the moment? Sure. So I recently joined Big Fish. When I say recently, I've actually been there almost nine nine months. It <laughs> feels like it's been longer. And I, I, I basically jumped into running Evermerge, which has been incredibly exciting because majority of my experience comes from Hidden Object and Match 3. So Merge, is, let's say as, as of last year, it's pretty hot. So kind of being in the thick of it now and one of the top games in Merge has been incredibly exciting. Yeah, so let's get into that because I do know about the game. We were working also ourselves on a Merge game. And I know as well how crowded is also at the moment the market with Merge <laughs> games. But particularly Evermerge is a very big game and it's amazing from Big Fish that they managed to really pull it out with this title after a dominance for a long time, games of like Merge Dragons and Merge Magic, so also from the same developer. Can you tell us more about what your role and responsibility are as a director of product management of Evermerge? Majority of my experience, I've usually joined a game once it's already live, and I focus on the growth stage. So it's not entirely accurate to say it's been in my entire career, but a lot of the games that I've done that actually for. So for Farm Heroes, I joined right after I went live on mobile. I joined Evermerge after it had already been live. I think Evermerge is about two years old now. So I joined like way after their soft launch when they were already into hard launch. So I would say for Evermerge in particular, most businesses want to see the Dow grow and they want to see revenue grow. And then that way they can you know, say this is a top whatever game. It, it, it ends up fulfilling business needs for the company. So majority of my days spend a lot of time kind of digging in data, figuring out what do we need to do? When do we need to do it? And then setting up context for why we need to do something. Or if we don't have any of that, then filling in the gaps and saying, okay, well, I know we need to be looking at these areas of the game in order to figure out how we're going to make it to grow. So then putting together a plan of, okay, so how do we get to that place? This X is missing, Y is missing. Let's fill those things in and then get to a place where we can basically make data-driven decisions and grow the game. Yeah, we'll get back later to that as well, more for your previous experiences. But as I understand, your objective now with the merge, of course, is product management, but really focusing on growth. Are you thinking about how you can grow the DAU because it's also related to acquisition, right? The strategy, mm -hmm. uh, are you working with marketing? I don't know, partnerships? In the larger companies I've joined, and I would consider Big Fish to be a larger company, meaning it's a 200, not 20. Luckily for me, we have divided responsibilities, but we work hand in hand. There is an actual growth team that focuses on user acquisition. And then my job for them is usually around what are the product improvements that we can make to make acquiring users easier for them. So if we want to grow the game, we have to obviously buy. Sometimes organics help, but I think these days you really need to purchase users because if, usually the organics go up as well. So in order to do that, you either need to put in more money from the business or you need the product to generate more money. I come in, I'm like, okay, I'm going to help get this product to a place where we're generating more money basically working with marketing, they now have more opportunity to, to spend. And the focus is really... Um, Product improvements. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then in some way, uh, of course, uh, facilitating the user acquisition, that's always easier that way. You have quite a big team as well. As we say, it's quite common as well to have large teams for uh, games that are successful and in this stage of live ops. How similar or different was it from your previous experiences 
So I've emerged is about 100, but it's divided. So Big Fish is about 50, and then we have another developer working on it, which is about 60. So roughly, we're about 100 people. I think this team size depends heavily on what the company's philosophy is for how they want teams to work. Some companies keeping teams as small as possible, and it makes sense. Lean teams, you know, reduce the complexity of communication that you have between people. You can work much faster. However, when you have certain games, they have a huge pipeline of content that you need to make, and you just need people making the content for the game. So I think it depends. In this case, we're about 100, and I've worked on teams previously that I think the smallest team I worked in was Mm 35-ish. And then Evermerge might be the largest team I've worked on. I think 100 is about the largest I've worked on. I have never actually led such a big team. So a bit about the organization. Who are your main partners? Who's your core team, basically? It's had a number of transformations. I think Big Fish has, has I think they used a GM previously. So one GM kind of overseeing the whole thing. And now what they're trying is they've divided it between two people. So they've separated out product and production. I'm serving as product owner, and I have a partner that handles all of the execution and production. That's that's generally how it's divided. There's a lot of different ways we can approach it. Having one large group team of 40, so meaning have one source of work, one backlog on everything for a group of of 40, even the 100, it's very difficult to manage. So what we're looking at potentially now is dividing into smaller groups that have set focuses. I've seen it work at previous companies, so we're going to give it a go. But the best thing we can do is try and adapt. So this is the most recent information I have of something that I've seen work. And then we go in knowing that it may work in this case, it may not. And if it doesn't, then we slowly start to change it and get something that works for this product, you know, this team, this culture. I hear as well that you are a testing structure as you go. How does this work? I think it's a conversation between me usually and the executive producer. Her focus as execution, I mean, how you structure a team can directly affect what the execution tends to look like, what processes are needed. So definitely not going in and telling her what to do. (laughs) My partner is Kristen Overton, and I mean, she has 20 years experience at games and tech. She's fantastic. We come from completely different paths. So it's also been fantastic to hear what her perspective has been. And then we've been trying to combine them in ways that we think might work for this team. So it's definitely an open conversation for sure. I've always been fascinated by the um, military, almost, I would say, organization of live office because it has to be very well organized structure. You need to deliver predictability and quality. I agree. I agree. <laughs> so uh, then in your position, then focusing on the product growth, increasing LTV, what are your main challenges on this position? For those who have played Evermerge know it, it is a complex game. So when I've worked in match three, it's relatively straightforward in terms of how the economy is set up and what you need to do. The game is typically linear. It's easier to find out where the monetization points are, so where people tend to pay and why. A lot of the complexity is in the background of the individual content, which would be the levels. That's kind of where like you see the ducks and then their feet are kind of going underneath. For match three, a lot of that's, I'd say, in the puzzle. With Evermerge, For those who have not played it, it's a merge game. You can merge three or more. You can merge five, you can merge seven. And the way it's structured is like nestled loops. So you have game design loops and all the systems are connected. You have to do certain actions without any sort of linear order. So the game right now is not linear. You can kind of progress in it as you kind of see fit. There's certain areas of the game you'll want to play more. Maybe you're more inclined as a player. You like organizing or you like the merging or you like the hero crafting system or any of those. And then you can kind of dig into your own path. Eventually you have to do a little bit of everything, but you're not required. You're not necessarily required to with any sort of push. That makes it very tricky to kind of figure out what the ideal player journey is. It's a very, it's a bigger economy. And then figuring out what the levers are is a lot more complex than something I would say like a match three. So one of the challenges is defining what good looks like in something that's this large. What are the best and fastest ways to increase spend? That would probably be one of the bigger challenges I'm facing today. It resonates actually quite well for me because we were also working on our merch game and it had also a deeper system and everything was connected and it made it also really hard for us 
and probably the reason why at some point we had to question if we would continue. And here you have a mature product, so like proven product that already works well. So I understand as well the, the nature of challenges, like all the change you can make, how they affect and probably working with a lot of A-B tests. So. It's almost like, I don't want to say like whack-a-mole, but it's a kind of similar process. Like you'd make one change here and then something pops up on the other side that you weren't expecting and you're like, wait, <laughs> And then you go back and you realize, ah, it's connected by this way. And it's it's pushing players through kind of this journey that maybe you did or didn't realize was happening. You know, these bigger games with really complex economies, you have to be very careful in terms of how you start to change them. You'll have how you want the game to be, and then you have how the players actually interact with it. And sometimes they're not the same. And then if they're not the same, which most of the time they're not, then you have to figure out, well, how are they interacting with it? against what I wanted? And then do I need to actually go back and change or adapt the original design to work as I need it to work? And therefore, as if I need to make a quick change, like, okay, this game needs to make more money or whatever, I actually have the ability to do that. I'm curious how you organize your focus and priorities. As you mentioned, you are looking into more of the operational part, like how to grow the game. But there's probably a dimension on leading the team, organizing your product team. A part that is more open, like I call it R&D, checking the market, what's happening, coming up with new ideas. So how do you organize those priority and your time? If I could wish for anything, like there was a genie, I think I would wish for more hours just in my day so I could accomplish more. <laughs> <laughs> my days and weeks, I think no two are the same. What I need to do ends up changing a lot, which is fine with me because personally, I don't like getting into a lot of routines. Unless it's going to the gym, I don't like routine. So I don't like doing repetitive tasks day after day. So that's why certain roles don't work for me at all. And other ones kind of like this one where some days I have to firefight, which is fine. And then other days I have to figure out, okay, I don't want to be reactive. And keeping me on my toes like that, I actually quite enjoy. To keep organized work-wise, I usually have to-do lists and then I have multi-tiered to-do lists and I keep track of literally everything because then it's not staying in my head as much and then I have space in my mind to actually think of things. But I think some of the challenges are like, I don't do a very good job now of staying on top of the market. I used to play all the games, like everything I could get my hands on, I would play and I don't have as much time as I used to to do that. So I cheat a little bit. I'll keep track of what other people are talking about. If something is trending, I'll play that. But yeah, I would say that is one area I would love to be a little bit better at in finding more time to either, not even just looking at gaming trends, like what's going keeping track of what's going on in the world. <laughs> I mean, we have so much information that is sent to an overwhelming amount uh, that it's really hard to keep up. But indeed, that's part of the challenge. Like, how do we organize time or priorities? And that's why I was curious how you're dealing with this challenge of always more to do than you can actually uh, give the attention to. Heavy prioritization. Yeah. And I've been cheating a little bit. So this is not a plug for The Economist, but I signed up for The Economist and I read headlines, that actually makes the biggest difference. Sometimes I think I sign up for, I'm in a number of different newsletters. And what's really good is they give me bite-sized summaries of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I think it's games beat and venture beat. And all I have to do is scan. <laughs> okay, is there anything I should dig deeper in? But that's, that's actually been helping. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I do the same as well. And then you investigate further if there's something really you need to, you know, or no. Exactly. Because sometimes you just get information for the sake of information, but if you don't have really actionable with it, is it always worth your time? Being informed is important, but if you can not translate into an action, then you have to curate a little more where you put your attention. And how you lead your product team, I was curious, you have a certain approach and philosophy to it, your style. Can you talk more about it? So... Even though I'm working with a team of 40, at the moment, I only have three direct reports, which is good because I don't have the bandwidth to take more. How I lead them in my style has been driven by two things. One is reflecting on both the good and bad managers I've had, and then thinking about what made them good, and in my opinion, what made them bad. And then the other thing has been trying to fill in gaps. So I've done a couple of trainings. So King had offered some great trainings for management. And then I spent a lot of time reading books about people management, leadership, how to handle conflict, how it relates to neuroscience. And I think that those I've tried to kind of push together into a general philosophy of how I would define and then how I want to be at least a decent leader. What is the thing that you learned from books that really like marked you and, and shaped your leadership practices? So I got really into 
David Rock's books, and he was combining how the brain works versus leadership. So one of the things that really stuck with me is I never want to be a leader where I have to tell a team what to do, right? I don't want to tell my direct reports, you need to do this because that doesn't scale, right? Then if I have three, oh, it seems easy. But then if I have 10, if I have 20, if I have multiple teams, no one has that type of bandwidth to be able to do that. So you have to focus on how do you create the situation and the framework by which people can come up with their own path and their own reasoning that aligns with where you want them to go. So one of the things that David Rock was writing about was what type of questions you need to ask. And they can't be leading questions, but actually taking time and understanding, helping people working through their own process of problem solving and the guidelines for it without directing it to a place where you're doing the thinking for them. And that's what I've been trying to do. And I'm better at it certain days than others because it is more time consuming. It's definitely more time consuming, (laughs) but that's generally how I've been trying to grow and lead a team. From my experience as well, this is the best way to grow people and also having a self-organized or autonomous team who will come up anyway with better solution than your own because they are in a place where they have more insights and so on. It does take more investment upfront, that's true. But in the long term, it's a compound effect where the more trained, the more proficient and autonomous the people are, then at some point, you know, it skyrockets and then they surprise you with their uh, solutions, ideas, plans, and then you can take care of other problems. (laughs) I completely agree. One of my personal philosophies has always been the product is important, but without people, you don't have a product. So if you're going to spend time investing in one area, it needs to be the people. And the more you invest them, as exactly as you said, it's a compound effect. They get better, the product gets better. Great. So as we talk also about leadership and growing people, I was curious in your own career, taking a step back about your own journey in gaming, because you've been also in amazing companies working on pretty big products. I was curious how the shift from probably product management position to promotions, director roles, where it happened and how it happened. I don't want to seem incredibly pessimistic, but I won't lie. It was incredibly difficult. I wish I could Mm -hmm. say it was easy, but it was incredibly difficult. The ease of promotions depended entirely on the company I was working at and its culture. Sometimes it was easy and then other times It felt like it was an uphill battle of which, you know, I had no, there was no end in sight. You know, naively, I always thought it was going to be based on contribution or merit. It's really not. Sometimes it's based on completely other things like perception or how much your manager liked you. The only thing I did do, and I'm doing it more as I get older, is that you have to fight for yourself. You have to fight for what you think you deserve, whether it's a promotion or a raise or different responsibility, or if you want the ability, you know, to speak at an all hands or a town hall, any of that, you need to be very clear into what you want and you need to ask for it. And then you need to repeat it. And that is the minimum I would recommend going into promotions or or literally anything. Yeah. That's a very good and important advice, as I was also speaking with other women in director roles and the conclusion was kind of similar. You cannot wait for it. As you say, like fight for it. You have to know your worth, what is your contribution and pitch it basically. Yes. And like I used to when I was young, my mentality was, well, I'm doing a good job. I have results. The things I'm doing are yielding results. I think there was only one place I can think of that recognized it. And it was one of my early jobs in my head is, yes, if I do good job and if I can see measurable results, everyone will know and I'll be acknowledged for it. And that just (laughs) does not translate. Every company is really different. And sometimes it it just doesn't matter. And you mentioned also some different organization and culture. And without going in detail of the cultures of a company you've been at, reflecting also on your career. What are the main things in your track and journey you learned from your time at Scopoli and King that led you finally to a Big Fish? So I guess some common themes, culture, not culture. Whenever I join a team that's already live and usually had just launched or has been out for a little while, most of the time, everything I do is around figuring out how to monetize players. So in terms of like what, what I've been asked to do, that's usually pretty consistent. And I think that's just the nature of like a game goes live. And if you want to grow it, that's what you got to do. As you said before, you got to increase the LTV and then actually it can scale. 
I've been very fortunate to work also for companies that value data, approaching decision-making using hypothesis-driven development, and then using data to make informed decisions. So some companies are great and they have a fantastic creative division that has awesome instinct, but it's instinct and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And the most success I've seen is when you take really creative and talented people that have very good design instincts and find a way to couple them with a very strong data arm. I haven't seen this done perfectly. I've seen glimpses of it in various places I've worked, but when it has happened, that's where I've seen, in my opinion, the best results. And the choice to join Big Fish, given your uh, track record, you could join places with big names, big games. I wish I had like a really fun, interesting story. But to be honest, my time at King, I made some really great friends and I joined at a great time. And a lot of those King people that I used to work with that I'm close to have since left. And there were a bunch that went to Big Fish. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, hey, uh, we're looking for this role. You'd be great. And then I spoke to them and they loved working for the company. I'm ambitious. Won't lie. I'm, I'm very ambitious. And the opportunity of having a chance to work on such a big product like Evermerge was literally kind of like dangling jewels in my face. <laughs> so I have, you know, people I, I, I know and trust already there that like it. And then a great opportunity for a game that needs to grow. And that's usually what I've done. So it was something it was very hard to say no to. More here for uh, personal development. Have you used in the past or even now the support of a coach or a mentor in your career? So I wish I had had a coach or a mentor. I've had some really fantastic managers that I still keep in touch with, but I wouldn't consider them necessarily like a mentor because I define a mentor as someone that takes an interest in helping your career, maybe checking in a few times a year. That's how I define it. And as much as I value keeping in touch with my former managers, it's more of a, hey, how are you doing type of thing. It's not focused around my career development. I hope I don't offend any of the great managers I worked with, but I wouldn't classify our relationship as a mentor mentee type. A long time ago, actually, <laughs> there was a group that we had like put out on blast, like, hey, we're offering mentorships with women that have been in, you know, in games for a while. I think it was focused on maybe like narrative design or something. Or, and I had signed up and then never really heard back. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and so I, I did try. I did try, just not successfully. And when I was at King, actually, they had a program where we could sign up to be a mentor. And I did do that. And that actually was incredibly rewarding. I was trying to work with her, what I had wished someone had helped me with when I was first getting into gaming. So it was going through like, how do we bucket your experience in a way that companies will want to see? How do we set you up to stand out? Let's work on your CVs. Let's work on your cover letter. Here's a list of interview questions I would ask. And I usually write down good questions I was asked in interviews. So I have a very long list of things I was asked. And so I was going through and kind of giving her all of this. And That's what I would have loved to have definitely early in my career. <laughs> and you mentioned something important here. You learn a lot by mentoring others, actually. I did that as well. And by being mentored, of course, you get a lot, but you can also mentor others. And the type of questions you can think of to help someone grow, it is a different relationship as a manager because there's nothing at stake except your own development, right? It's not like a, the person is expecting you to do a certain job, but there's an interest in developing you for the goal of a unit. So it's true. We cannot say exactly that managers are your mentors. They can coach you in some areas, but they are also not your coach. And it's something separate, I would say. Yeah, they can absolutely coach you when you're at the company, but it's usually within what the company's goals are, right? Yes. It's set within those objectives. And sometimes, you know, your career it could be, you know, contrary to those objectives, then it's not necessarily in your best interest, for example. I, I would love to have a mentor. So if anyone listening to this is interested... <laughs> I, I think it's also in our position, we want to keep growing, but your uh, managers are already executive level, C-level, and they don't have the time or uh, focus to develop you. So how can we keep growing? Anyone at any point you can always learn something. And you need to be proactive to actually get a, a mentor or a coach. And from my experience, it was encouraged when I was at Rovio to pick up people like inside the company or out of the company. And I chose a CEO of a Finnish company. He accepted as well. And we had uh, amazing talks and that thinking broad, having the big picture. And I realized how much 
I didn't know yet from this world, you know, thinking on an executive level. And you can't identify that by yourself. It's impossible. I hope for the ones listening here as well, like really looking to mentor others, like people like you to be in touch. But I would tell you as well, if you like really someone and their philosophy in the industry, just ask and see what happens. That's what I do. The only thing you can get is a no and uh, okay, you spend a few minutes, you send an email or something. But the upside of this is very big. So if you have people in mind, go for it. <laughs> Okay, I will. I, I think the the hurt of rejection that was like ten years ago has healed. So I think I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready to yeah, try yeah. again. <laughs> yeah, we have to work for our development. It's something that we always have to do ourselves. If you are looking back in the, at your early twenties, what would you tell to uh, young Laura what she could do in the past and why? Oh. So I'd love to come in and say what most people want to hear, right? You know, be persistent, try harder, do all that stuff. But honestly, when I was in my 20s, I was really naive. And if I had to give myself advice, it would be be more cynical. I know that sounds like counterintuitive, but there's an element, I think, where, where I was very weak was the politics aspect that's required in probably not all, but most jobs you take, there's going to be an element of politics. And it's not always based on merit. And sometimes it's not enough to be good at what you do or even to be right about something. In some cases, it's almost as important to be liked. And there's going to be times in anyone's career, certainly there were times in mine, and I don't think I always made the right choice, where you will have to choose between what's good for the game or whatever project you're working on, and then what's good for your career. And they're not always the same, as crazy as that sounds. Perception is incredibly important, and it's something that once it's set by a number of people, it is impossible to change. And I don't like to exaggerate, but it is very, very difficult, sometimes impossible to change. I like this example. So when I went to university, I went to a good school, and I, I used to think that getting into a good school was a barometer for intelligence, and it's not. There were plenty of students that were in really good schools that were not there on merit. And the same is going to happen with jobs. <laughs> you will have leaders and bosses that should not be in the positions they are in, and there's really nothing you can do about it. And then you have to make a choice as to whether you can endure it or you leave. And I know it sounds negative, and in some ways it is, but I think if, if people already know this, by all means, I'm so happy for you. I wish I had someone had kind of sat me down and told me this in my 20s because I was not prepared for this. But if I could go back and say, young Laura, here's what you need to know, I, I would rattle off that list. Let's take a moment to reflect on that because it is an important topic and it's not one that is talked about so openly. And I have to say for some, it happens quite naturally, but it depends highly on the environment. How how do they grow people, right? I do see and agree that perception precedes you more than actually what you do. And you probably know that as uh, women in a leadership group where you are the single one. And yeah, okay, we have our point of view. We have a way of expressing. But the gender is unfortunately um, a factor of minority, especially in executive groups. It is indeed sometimes situation where it may not serve you in the relationship you're building with the people who can have a decision of promoting you or not. It's unfortunate because the choice is like, I will never grow here. Do I leave or do I, you know, persist? Do I endure? What do I need to do to play by the rules of the game? And then when I get to the position where I have more influence and power, then I can maybe start to change things. And that has been my approach as well in my career where I've not always agreed in the ways of how things work. To accept the reality, you accept it to join a culture and environment. You cannot change it. You don't expect to change it or you are not in a position to change it. And if you want to grow in your career in this place, you have to play by the rules of the game, whether Mm -hmm. you like it or not. Yes, absolutely. And the work is about identifying the rules of the game first. Yes, I would say like, okay, so that's actually great advice. When you start a job, discover what the rules are. So then at least you know where the boundaries are set. Very good point and important. And when you reach a certain position of responsibility, influence, and power or credibility, then also here the perception can play on your side where you have your reputation that precedes you. And then it's easier, you know, to make things happen in the way you see it. About director of product roles, what do you think are the main skills needed for this position? I think it depends a little bit on the organization you're joining. Certain orgs and certain cultures and companies, they're going to see product as needing to be 
more data-driven. Some people want them to have a certain ability to understand and work with creative. Others want them to be more technical. So there's not going to be like kind of one tried sense of these are the skills you need. I think the best case would be you need to be able to wear a lot of different hats and you have to at least be able to have a high understanding of anything that goes into a game. So can I compare like code lines with the technical director? No. But can we have a conversation about high level how things should be set up based on what the product needs are? Yes. So my understanding is enough that I can influence even though I can't actually do necessarily the work. So same with design, you need to have a pretty good understanding of the design of the market you want to be in. Data, I think no matter where you go, you're going to have, to, the only thing I would say is that you you need to have a very good understanding of how the game works, how it functions, how that translates to behavioral data, and then how you can action it. Where I would draw the line is you probably don't need to be going in and writing queries. I'd say similarly, I always find that people that I really respect, either in my role or higher, also have the ability to diffuse heated situations very well. So a certain element of conflict management that they're very good at. I think the worst thing that anyone can do is that when you get into kind of these levels, you're going to be in heated discussions. And the point is to always make it constructive. So being able to redirect and steer people in the direction of working constructively versus destructively. It's a skill. And I think the better you can do it and the better you can work with with people, the stronger you'll be at, at, the, at these types of roles. And then those people that I think are naturally curious, I also think would go quite far. It's very easy to kind of get stuck in what would be the kind of the status quo, kind of move everything along as it's going, but not necessarily push to figure out, well, how can this be better? Or this is a very small thing that happened that could be interesting. Should I explore this more? And I think that those types of people also would serve well, not just in director roles, but just in product roles as well. Great breakdown. Thanks. I'm learning a lot as well from your own path and lessons. All right. So we're reaching the end here and I'd like to end it with three rapid fire questions. The idea is that you just answer quickly what's in your mind. Are you ready? Yes. All right. So first question, what is the thing that is occupying the most your thoughts these days? Honestly, I spend my days and nights thinking about how I'm going to grow Evermerge, <laughs> how the game's working and how I can help it work better. That's probably what I think of before I go to sleep. And the th first thing I wake up is what are the things I need to do today to get closer to what my goal is for the game? <laughs> and it's not normal. It's usually not on my brain. Like with, with previous projects, sometimes yes, but sometimes no. So this is, it's a little more unusual. It's, Well, it sounds to me, this is the most exciting and complex challenge you can have at the moment. So it's good. It yes. will keep you busy. <laughs> yes, it will keep you busy. All right. And my second question is, what is the thing you fear the most these days? Okay. This is me a little bit vulnerable. Honestly, sometimes I feel like a complete imposter. And I think a lot of people feel that way. And I don't think my feeling is unique or special. But sometimes I wake up and think, Do I actually know what I'm doing? Do I know what I'm doing? Maybe I don't know what I'm doing, and that's the problem. So I'd say that that probably is the sinking into the fear that what if I'm right? What if I don't know what I'm doing? Okay. <laughs> and at last, what is your uh, motto in life? My motto in life. Okay, I'm trying to think of what I tell myself when things are tough. It's probably a couple of things. One, The only constant thing is change, right? So things that are tough now are not going to be tough later. Again, if I'm telling myself a motto, it's usually because I need to get myself through something. And sometimes the best thing to do is just do nothing. I have massive to-do lists and I'm often doing, 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 doing. And for me, sometimes I just need to say, okay, right now I'm going to do nothing and I'm going to wait. So not necessarily a motto, but I'd say that's what I tell myself when, when I need to give myself kind of, I need to reassess or have a pep talk. That's actually a great reminder and advice. I think a bit like you as well in terms of personality. So I'm always <laughs> like, you know, firefighting is like, problem, let's fix it now, now, tomorrow, and <laughs> not tomorrow, today. Yeah. Yesterday, and, yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I learn also the hard way sometimes that seeing new insights coming as you let time pass or in the moment you are more in like uh, in freezing paralysis analysis and it's not going to help. So every time, although it's very counterintuitive, but you are reminding me of not doing is also an action. Yes, definitely avoiding an action that may be something you have to then go back and change later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a balance. So. It's a balance. It's very inspiring for this end of conversation. 
I enjoyed the talk today, Laura. And, Me too. Uh, This is fun. Thank you very much. And good luck for the growth of Evermerch. I'm looking forward to see how the revenue will grow during this year. Well, me too. <laughs> bye. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to this new episode of Raise and Play podcast. If you enjoyed the content and want to support what we're doing, rate and review the podcast. Spread the word about it. If you'd like to contribute to the change too, reach out to me on LinkedIn for a collaboration. You'll find all the rest of the content on riseandplay.io, including my free masterclass on conscious leadership, how to hire a team with a vision, or how to lead and build a team for the long-term game. Until the next time, 